So what I want to do today is recap a little bit what we talked about last time, um, reiterate some of the important points, and then um, show you uh, how we can learn something about microorganisms in the environment by talking about in situ identification of microorganisms as well as um, genomics. Um, we'll first talk about genomics in general and then talk about some applications of genomics to environmental microbiology because I think there's some of the most exciting new developments are in that area actually. So last time um, we talked about molecular evolution and ecology. And just to recap, some of the main points were that we can actually use genes or gene sequences for a couple of very important um, uh, 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 questions that we uh, want to explore. The first one was gene sequences act as evolutionary chronometers. Now, what do we mean by that? Basically, what we said last time is that each gene, each sequence in the genome accumulates mutation with a certain probability. So what we mean is that all genes accumulate mutations over time. Now these, of course, are the mutations that do not kill the organism. So not the deleterious mutations, but these are mutations that are either slightly deleterious or don't matter, or the beneficial mutations, okay? And what this entails, and that uh, each gene accumulates mutation with a certain probability over time, it basically means um, that two organisms that come from species that are relatively closely related to each other have, uh, their gene sequences will be much more similar to each other than um, genes from an organism that comes from a species that's much more distantly related. So in, in practical terms, what this means is your genes are much, much more similar to those of a monkey than they are to a crocodile, for example. And we can take advantage of that by applying some algorithms, some mathemat mathematical modeling, essentially, to constrain these relationships in those phylogenetic trees that we uh, talked about last time. And I also mentioned that the ribosomal RNA genes are particularly important for that process. In principle, you could do it with any protein coding gene or any kind of gene in a genome, but we use the ribosomal RNA genes in particular because all organisms have them. They're part of a handful of genes that are what we called universally distributed last time. And what this allows us to do is then to construct phylogenetic relationships for all living organisms, okay? And I just want to remind you of the tree of life that I showed last time where we can really explore um, the relationships amongst all living organisms. And um, some of the important points there that we made were, for example, that the tree of life supports the endosymbiont theory. That when you actually look on the tree where the mitochondria and the chloroplasts tree, they fall into the bacteria. Now, there was a question um, where somebody asked uh, in, in your online survey, um, can the mitochondria and chloroplasts still live outside of the eukaryotic cell? And the answer is no, they can't anymore because um, the over evolutionary times, the two organisms have become so integrated that um, the mitochondria and chloroplasts have both lost their ability to live outside of the eukaryotic host cell. Another important point that we made last time um, that I want to reiterate here is that gene sequences, when we go into the environment and obtain them directly from the environment, act as a proxy for microbial diversity in the environment. So the number 
of genes recovered directly from the environment is a measure of diversity. And we said that this actually plays a very, very important role in the analysis of microbial communities. And I showed you this example here where we went to, um, took some ocean water and basically applied this technique that I outlined last time where we can actually amplify ribosomal RNA genes from environmental samples, clone them, determine the sequence, and then construct phylogenetic trees. And what you see here is a tree where we uh, uh, summarize the major groups that we found in this uh, uh, sample, and then only for two of those groups do we show the entire set of sequences that we actually obtained because there were so many of them out there. And what we basically found is that over 1,500 bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences coexist in this, in, in this environment. And what we said also last time is that Analyses like these have really taught us that microorganisms are the most diverse organisms in the planet. So most diversity is amongst the microorganisms. And one of the big questions now is, um, what are all those microorganisms doing in the environment? And so today what I want to do with you is basically explore this question, how we can actually figure out what those microorganisms are all doing in environmental samples. So we can say we're exploring the function of microbes in the environment. And first I want to cover how we can actually identify them in situ in the environment. And I want to show you one specific example. And then I want to talk about genomics in general. And then basically end with an application of genomics to environmental questions. So let's first talk about the in situ identification of microorganisms. And the basic problem that I alluded to already before is that most microbes are only known from 16S ribosomal RNA clone libraries. And we basically want to search and identify them in the environment. Okay, and I'll show you a specific example of that later on. Now, last time, we said that the ribosomal RNA sequences consist really, like all gene sequences, in fact, of several, we identified several stretches of nucleotides, types of stretches that can be found. We said the A type stretches and B type stretches that are very important for constructing phylogenetic relationships because we can align them and look for changes in the nucleotide sequences because um, they're of the same length and only differ in um, mutations and in single nucleotide uh, base pair changes. But then there's also those C-type stretches, if you remember, and those, we said, vary at much faster rates because they are not functionally constrained in those genes. Okay? 
So they can actually also accumulate um, length changes. And it's these C-type stretches that we can use sort of as diagnostic sequence stretches for microorganisms. So what we can say is we identify organisms by the C-type stretches C-type sequence stretches and we call those signature sequences. Okay. And they allow the differentiation of closely related organisms. Because they vary at very fast rates between organisms. And the way we do this is we construct so-called phylogenetic probes. Oh, I should probably write this over here. Now, what are those phylogenetic probes? They're basically short pieces of DNA that have a fluorescent molecule attached to them. DNA molecules that are roughly 20 nucleotides in length and they carry a fluorescent molecule. Now what these short single-stranded stretches of DNA basically are is they are complementary to those C-type sequence stretches. in the ribosomal RNA. And so basically what we can do is we can collect microbial cells from the environment make them permeable and then basically mix them with those phylogenetic probes. And these probes will then permeate into the cell and bind to their complementary sequences. <coughs> then we wash away the unbound probe And we can view it in a microscope under UV light, okay? Let me show you an example of this. What you see here basically is a 
light micrographs. So this is what you see basically when you collect microbial cells from the environment under the microscope. Most bacteria look the same. So you cannot actually differentiate them at all by just looking at them. Now, but then these cells were fixed and permeabilized and then basically mixed with two different phylogenetic probes that identified two, two different types of organisms. One was labeled with a red fluor, the other one with a green fluor. And what you see is that you can now differentiate those two organisms. Now, why is this actually interesting? Well, this here is just a specific example um, where people were looking for um, bacteria capable of nitrogen oxidation. These are bacteria that are very important in, for example, sewage treatment. And it's, it was known already that there's two different types out there. One that oxidizes ammonia to nitrite. And then a second one that oxidizes nitrite to nitrate. And by doing this type of analysis, what people basically learned was that those two organisms live in very, very close proximity at all times. So the organisms that oxidize ammonia to nitrite are really attached and oftentimes even surround the organisms that take the nitrite to nitrate. So what you have is a very close cooperation between two different types of microorganisms and a transfer of one of the substrates um, that's a product of the metabolism of one of the organisms to another one. So an extremely efficient process that really is very important to take into consideration when you want to understand processes like sewage treatment, but also nitrogen um, biogeochemistry in the environment. Any questions? Okay, so um, for the remainder of the lecture, I want to talk about um, genomics. And then in particular also its application to questions of environmental microbiology and uh, environmental science. So first, what I want to do is give you a little bit of a definition of um, genomics. Then I want to cover how it is actually possible that we can sequence entire genomes. And then I want to give you some highlights of what we have found by comparing different genomes to each other. And then I want to talk about this field about environmental genomics, where we can use genomic techniques to actually learn something about the function of different uncultured microorganisms in the environment. So first, our definition. It's basically to interpret or to sequence interpret and compare whole genomes. And as you will see, the comparison part actually plays an increasingly important role because we have now actually genome sequences available from almost all or from at least some of the major groups of life. So we have a lot of, um, this again is a, a different kind of representation of a tree of life. You have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya again. And as you can see, we have a lot of representatives. In fact, this doesn't even uh, come close to the diversity that we have now sequenced. There's well over 100 bacterial genomes sequenced now, several archaeal genomes, and increasingly also eukaryote uh, genomes. <clears throat> 
Now genomes, so how is this done? How can we actually sequence genomes? Well, on the face of it, we use um, very large facilities where you have uh, sequencing machines present. There's one very important one at MIT, actually, in um, the Broad Institute. And here you see all those um, really uh, industrial-scale production lines, actually. But the problem, the basic problem, is that genomes are large. E. coli, for example, has roughly 4.4 million base pairs. And the human genome is even much, much larger. It has about 3 billion base pairs. Okay? So genomes are very, very large, but an a single sequencing reaction gives you only roughly 500 to 1,000 nucleotides or base pairs. So how is it that we can actually sequence um, entire genomes? I want to walk you through this, and there's some variations on the theme, but um, this is still um, uh, sort of a major uh, approach that's still used in, in, some of, in, in a majority of the sequencing facilities. Now you start out by extracting genomic DNA from organisms, and then you use restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into relatively large pieces of DNA. So about 160 kilobase pairs long. On average, as is shown here, now kilo means 1,000, so 160,000 base pairs long. These pieces are then cloned into specific cloning vectors that are called back vectors. So therefore, cloning large pieces of DNA. And BAC stands for bacterial artificial chromosome. And what they basically are are plasmids, very special plasmids that can carry large pieces of genome or large genome fragments. So by cloning into those back vectors, what you do is you basically divide up the genome, and you can, then this is step number three, is mostly done for um, eukaryotic genomes because they're so much larger. You can actually map then those, uh, analyze the fragments and map them onto maps, uh, onto uh, genome maps where you know the location of different um, restriction fragments and different uh, genes actually. For bacteria, this step is mostly skipped actually. What you do then with each one of those bags is you cut them further up into one kilobase per fragment, so smaller, much smaller fragments. And these are called, um, and th this is then actually, these are cloned then into normal plasmid vectors, and so you generate what is called shotgun clones. So these are then cloned into E. coli, and basically you go through the same type of steps that we discussed uh, before already with environmental clone libraries, and you can actually determine the sequence of each one of those pieces of DNA. And what you will then get is small fragments of overlapping DNA sequence, okay? 
that is shown here. And you will find overlaps, basically, from which you piece together the whole genome. And so first you assemble, you piece together those large genome fragments that are present in the bags. And then finally you piece together the entire genome um, from those large sequence pieces and you get a so-called draft genome sequence. The next step in this analysis then is that you um, do so-called genome annotation. And the first very important step is that you translate the um, gene sequences into amino acids. So the nucleotide sequences into amino acids, particularly in prokaryotes. This step can be done um, right away. And what this allows you to do is you can look for um, what we call open reading frames, or ORFs. And what you look for is a start codon and a stop codon that basically branches um, or frames a stretch of amino acids encoded by the nucleotides. So you look for ORFs. And these are your putative genes. The next step that you can do then is that you go to databases and now you compare your ORFs to information that is present in the databases. So basically you inquire the database uh, and ask, is a gene sequence that is similar to the one that I have, statistically significantly similar present, that allows me to say something about the function of this particular gene. So function can then be identified by comparison with databases. Any questions? Okay, so and that allows you then basically to um, say something uh, about the different genes that, are, that you have found in the genome, but to give you an impression of how new this field really is and how little we still know about the diversity of genes in organisms, on average when we sequence a new bacterial genome we find about 30% of the genes, so a third of the genes have no known functional analog in the databases. Okay? So there's a lot to learn about the diversity of life and about the functional diversity of life. Okay? In eukaryotes, there's a little twist, as you all know. And basically that is that genes, of course, consists of introns and exons, right? And so it's basically relatively difficult to uh, directly identify those open reading frames. And what you have to do is that you have to actually oftentimes, so let's write this down. And what people oftentimes do then is that they search 
for matching sequences in so-called cDNA libraries. Now, what are cDNA libraries? Let me just show you this on the next slide. Oop. Skip this. Basically, what you can do is you can isolate messenger RNA from cells and then translate this messenger RNA by a process called reverse transcription. That's a viral enzyme that translates RNA into DNA. So you can translate it into DNA fragments and you can then clone those DNA fragments into plasmids, sequence those, and then basically see what are the pieces that are actually, um, what are the introns in the genes, what are the pieces that are excised um, when the messenger RNA is actually created uh, from uh, the genome. So let me just cover now a few of the major insights that people have come up with. Of course, it's a very uh, growing field and a lot of excitement is, is coming out. And I first want to talk about bacteria and archaea. And then say a few words also about eukaryotes or eukarya. First of all, what we learned about bacteria and archaea is that their genomes are very compact. Whenever they have pieces of DNA that are not frequently used, they're actually lost from the genome. Okay, so they lose genomes, uh, genes, I should say, uh, relatively easily. And we can see this, that the genome size, excuse me, is correlated to metabolic diversity. So for example, we have mycoplasma genitalium and streptococcus, uh, excuse me, streptomyces cellicolor are two very different bacteria. The first one is an obligate intracellular parasite. Okay. So which means it's actually bathed in a nutrient solution in the eukaryotic cells that it invades. It doesn't have to make amino acids. It gets it just from the host cell. And it turns out it has a very small genome. It's only 0.58 megabase pairs, so um, 580,000 base pairs, and only 517 genes. And interestingly, actually, people are now using this organism to try and ask, well, what's the minimum number of genes that an organism can actually live with? And so they're deleting in a stepwise fashion the different genes in this organism, and it turns out that um, you need about two to 300 genes minimum um, in order to uh, make the things uh, to survive. 
On the other hand, Streptomyces is a soil bacterium. Has a very complex lifestyle, can degrade um, a lot of uh, environmental substrates, and it has a very big genome, one of the biggest bacterial genomes. And so those two organisms basically span pretty much the, um, the, uh, the, the, the range of bacterial genome sizes. And so it's thought that it has about 7,846 genes. Now, we also have a very large genetic diversity between species. And typically what you find is that roughly 15 to 30 percent of genes are unique to a specific species. And that's really because bacteria and archaea have the capability to um, affect a lot of chemical reactions that eukaryotes, for example, cannot. There's about um, 20 million known organic substances, organic chemicals, and almost all of them are biodegradable by bacteria. Okay? Even the minutest compound, uh, if it were not biodegradable by bacteria, would build up in the environment. Okay? So if it just were a cofactor that some organism produces, because we have such a long period of time of evolution on this planet, um, and evolutionary history, it would, you would probably be able to dig it up in your backyard. One of the other very important and interesting insights that has come out of comparing genomes of microorganisms is that lateral gene transfer is a very important process amongst microorganisms. Now, what do we mean by lateral gene transfer? It basically means that we find evidence amongst bacterial genomes that they have actually taken up genes from completely unrelated organisms. And I just want to show you one example here, that of uh, Thermotoga maritima. which lives in hot springs. This is a very interesting bacterium that can live in hot water of around 80 degrees Celsius and um, thrives only in those kinds of environments. And it coexists there with many archaea. And when people sequence the genome of Thermotoga, what they found was that about 25% of the genes have their closest relatives in archaeal genomes. So roughly 25% of genes in Thermotoga are of archaeal origin. Now, how can we actually figure something like that out? Well, the most important technique is, again, uh, phylogenetic t uh, uh, tree construction. And so when you have, for example, gene A, well, let me draw this actually on a new board. 
So you're comparing, say, three organisms, organism A, B, and C, and you compare gene 1 with gene 2, and you notice that most genes adhere to this pattern, but then every now and then there's a gene that gives you this type of pattern. What you can then conclude is that this gene, C, has not co-evolved with the other genes in the genome of these organisms, but was actually transferred into it from another source. And I don't have time to go actually into the mechanisms. Um, if you're interested, I teach a, a graduate class um, that a lot of undergraduates actually take in our department, Environmental Microbiology, where we discuss a lot of the mechanisms. It's basically a lot of viruses can affect gene transfer, um, but also plasmids and transposons. But for bacteria, again, you should remember that new function is actually oftentimes, oftentimes arises by lateral gene transfer. And one of the interesting things is that lateral gene transfer is actually very important in um, the evolution of pathogenic bacteria. So the so-called virulence genes, which are the genes that basically um, affect pathogenesis. You had a question? Oh, yes. Among pathogenic bacteria, often arise bilateral gene transfer. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now, for eukarya, I just want to make the point that their genomes are generally orders of magnitudes larger. Okay. And that the exons, so the things, the stretches, that really encode the protein uh, that makes up uh, the organism. The exons are typically only few percent of the genome. That's particularly in higher eukaryotes. Yeasts, for example, have a much more compact genome also, but um, we, for example, have full of DNA that people still have a very hard time figuring out what it actually does. But it seems that the majority of the genome so-called repeated sequences many of which seem to be ancient retroviruses that have inserted themselves into the genome and have since then lost actually their function. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to just give you an example of um, how we now can use these techniques that I outlined before to learn something about microorganisms in the environment. environmental basically um, the way this all was started was by going into the environment 
and extracting nucleic acids and treating them exactly the same way as if you had a single genome. But again, remember we have a very large mixture of microorganisms present in the environment and where this was mostly done was in the ocean actually. And what people did was they constructed those back clones directly from the environment and then looked amongst those back clones for specific 16S ribosomal RNA genes. Remember, this is the marker that we have for microorganisms in the environment. We know the diversity of microorganisms through those types of genes, and we have a lot of data available. And so in order to link a specific function that such an organism that we only know from the 16S ribosomal RNA genes, um, uh, so to ask the question what uh, sort of function this organism might be carrying out in the environment, it's very useful to sequence back clones that have 16S ribosomal RNA genes on them and then determine what kinds of protein coding genes are on there that might reveal some of the function of the organism in the environment. And one example that I want to show you is that um, of the proteorhodopsin. So basically the initial um, task was to sequence back clones containing ribosomal RNA genes and look for other genes that might reveal some of the function. So you don't want to look for all the genes that encode proteins that are important in the cell cycle or things like that, but really sort of metabolic genes that might tell you something about the um, type of metabolism that this organism carries out in the environment. And so what the first example that turned out to be really, really important was that people found uh, rhodopsin genes on one of those um, back fragments. And it turns out this rhodopsin catalyzes or these rhodopsin genes produce a protein that inserts itself into the bacterial membrane and is a photoreceptor that when it's hit by light, it actually affects, uh, it's an, it becomes a proton pump. So it expels protons from the cell interior to the outside and you already know that this is important in energy generation in all living cells. So proton gradients across membranes basically give the cell sort of a battery status that can be exploited by ATPase molecules or ATPase proteins that equalize the proton gradient and affect ATP synthesis in doing so. Now why is this so important? Well, it turned out that this type of protein is present in almost all microbial cells that were previously thought to be heterotrophs alone in the ocean, in the, in the parts of the ocean that uh, receive enough light. And what this means is that our estimates of the global carbon budget of the ocean were basically wrong, okay? Because most microorganisms in the ocean have this So most prokaryotes in the ocean have a light-driven proton pump which is called proteorhodopsin And it basically allows them um, to gain energy from sunlight. And there's an increasing number of such examples now where real, 
we're really learning to interpret um, environmental uh, communities and environment, the function of environmental microbial communities through those genomic approaches. And it reveals um, basically uh, an enormous diversity of organisms out there. And what we're also learning to do now is to assemble entire genomes from those samples by applying um, genomic techniques. And this is an example here where you see uh, this was published last year where people went out and basically were able to piece together from pieces of genes obtained from the environment entire genomes or fragments of entire genomes. And that's shown here, um, those uh, contiguous sequences. Okay, so and if you have any questions, let me know via email or um, if you're interested in pursuing this further, uh, I also teach another class in civil environmental engineering.